Sorry, I need the countdown. Hi everyone, uh, welcome to this session, our final session of Eco-Socialism 2023. Um, this panel is Reconceptualising Revolution in the Age of the Climate Emergency. My name is Sarah Hathaway, I'm a Socialist Alliance local councillor and national co-convener from Geelong. Before we get started, I just want to acknowledge that we are meeting on stolen land. The Wurundjeri and Boonwurrung people of the Kulin Nation are the rightful sovereign owners of this land. Their sovereignty has never been ceded and the colonisation of their land continues to this day. We pay our respects to their elders, past, present and emerging. We pledge to actively support their campaigns to bridge the poverty gap, to stop Indigenous people being incarcerated and stop deaths in custody, for decent housing and to improve health outcomes, to name a few. This always was and always will be Aboriginal land. So I'm not going to do all the housekeeping stuff. I think that's a bit redundant at this point of the conference. Um, but I do want to encourage you all to stick around after this session. Um, feel free to head down to the loading bay, um, have some drinks, and there will be a barbecue. So we'd love to keep the political discussion going. Um, I'm sure many of you are aware by this point that Green Left is the host of this conference. Um, and if you are motivated to become an eco-socialist activist, uh, you can either join us or stay in touch via the contact sheets. Um, please have a chat with any of the conference organisers if you'd like any more information. Um, you're welcome to take photos or video and we just encourage you to use the hashtag eco-socialism2023 on the socials. <laughs> So, as the climate crisis worsens on a seemingly daily basis, the need to end the destructiveness of capitalism becomes more urgent. It is now starkly clear that a system based on profit cannot and will not deal with runaway climate change. The Marxist idea that humanity faces a future of socialism or barbarism is more manifestly relevant today than it ever has been before. Yet in many countries, the movements for eco-socialism are weak and fragmented, lacking leadership and unity. So the question posed for every progressive and environmentally conscious person is, how can we win change and make eco-socialism a reality before it's too late? This final session of the conference will share experiences explore the challenges and raise possibilities from socialists, Greens and progressive leaders in the Asia-Pacific region. So to introduce our speakers, our first speaker will be Liam Flanardi. Um, Liam is the Chief of Staff for Greens MP Elizabeth Watson-Brown and an activist with the South Brisbane Greens and Liam will be joining us on the big screen. Our second speaker is Farooq Tariq. Um, Farooq is the President of Pakistan's um, Socialist Party and a leading activist in the climate justice movement in Pakistan. Um, and our final speaker will be Susan Price. Susan is a co-editor of Green Left and a member of the Socialist Alliance National Executive. And after we hear from our speakers, there'll be time for questions and discussion at the end. So without further ado, Liam, if you're ready, we will hand over to you. Yeah, great. Thanks for the introduction, Sarah. Um, can everybody hear me okay? Is that all good? Perfect. Just Thanks, Liam. Rad. All right. Well, just let me know if I cut out because I'll sort of be reading a bit from stuff and won't necessarily be watching. Um, cool. Yeah. So thanks again, Sarah, and thanks um, Green Left for organising this and for inviting me to speak. And yeah, just want to also acknowledge that I'm I'm zooming in from Yaga and Turable land up here in Brisbane um, in my dilapidated back room uh, in Maruka um, and just acknowledge that sovereignty was never ceded and this is this remains stolen land. Look, I want to speak to some of my experience um, in building the Queensland Greens, helping build the Queensland Greens over the last seven or so years. And I want to make just three points in this um, in this sort of presentation. And the, so the first one is that I think, and Sarah sort of mentioned this, that we are in fact very far away 
from having the capacity to make, and I don't use the word revolution because I think it's needlessly confusing, but the, we, far away from having the capacity to make the fundamental social and political transformation that is required to redistribute power and wealth to the majority of people and to make sure that everybody is able to live a good life and, of course, to do what we can to get through uh, climate change and to stop the worst of it. Obviously, this is a depressing uh, fact given the urgency um, of climate change, but you, you obviously can't just wish things to be different. The second point I want to make is that paradoxically, I think we're actually a lot closer to this fundamental social and political transformation than it might appear. So, you know, fantasies of revolution will always be impossibly distant and just around the corner at the same time. But, you know, real social transformation is something that comes from patient work and for, for looking at the potential in, a, in a, any given situation. And it's my view and the view of many in the Greens and, and my friends in, in the Queensland Greens up here, that there's a lot of potential in the current situation in Australia. And I speak specifically about Australia. I don't want to speak about anything overseas. Um, the third point I want to make is that the primary barrier today is not the incorrect beliefs of people in this country. It's uh, actually just people's lack of belief that anything can change. Uh, and therefore that the strategy that we need to take going forward is to begin winning and to keep winning. Uh, wins opening space for more wins. Uh, people will not be radicalized by defeats or appeals just on the basis of the most correct ideas or morals. So that's the three points I wanna make. So I'll just kind of might try to elaborate each one now. Um, so firstly, that, you know, this, this, this bleak fact that, that this kind of transformation that we know we need is, is, is not just around the corner. Um, and I don't want to dwell on it too much, but I think it's worth taking a bit of stock. It's important to be sober um, in, what, in what we do in order to get the right uh, sort of strategy going forward. Because I think with the climate crisis, the moral imperative to transform society is perhaps greater now than it ever has been. Um, but that doesn't mean that we're any closer to it. And the tendency, I think, for a lot of people who are aware of how bad the situation is, is to want to find shortcuts and to talk as though we're further along than we are. Um, you know, we talk as though there's these things in Australian society called social movements, you know, like the environment movement, all these sorts of things. And I just genuinely don't think we have anything that we could really, really say is is. Uh, reaches the level of a social movement and that has a genuine large scale social roots, mobilizes a significant social force in society. We also talk as though there's this thing called the left in Australia, as though it's real um, and, and relevant, um, you know, strengthening the left, building the left, uniting the left. Well, I, you know, that's just as far as I'm concerned, it's, it's, um, it's not actually real in the sense that it has any bearing on the overwhelming majority of people um, uh, or relevance to the overwhelming majority of people in this country. And I think we try to kind of inflate ourselves because we, we want to hope that things are better, we have more of a position than we do. Um, but ultimately there is no real alternative to patiently building mass structures of political participation capable of bringing the overwhelming majority of people on board and exerting power over the current political and economic elite. And look, while we don't want to romanticize the past in Australia, um, I think we're, you know, at, in some ways further away than we were decades ago in this country from having that capacity. Um, in some ways, we might be closer, uh, <laughs> uh, but I'll get to that. Um, but we can obviously trace some of this collapse of capacity uh, to the Accords process here. And I think anybody who's a bit familiar with Australian history would understand this. And Liz Humphreys does an amazing uh, job in her book, How Labor Built Neoliberalism, in outlining just how um, uh, the Accords process led to this deterioration of capacity in uh, social organising in the country. Um, but but I, I don't want to make out like that was a uniquely Australian experience. Corporatism, that, that attempt to um, bring uh, working class institutions and the institutions of, of capital into some kind of bargaining uh, arrangement outside of the framework of both the um, shop floor and the uh, democratic process. Um, was something that was pursued all over the world, um, by the developed world anyway, primarily by social democratic parties. And I think it was just uniquely uh, successful in Australia um, and so uh, led to a particular outcome. The, the Accords, the idea that these corporatist structures would lead, the, the left wing sort of um, argument for them that they would lead to working class power being brought into the heart of the state um, clearly was not the case. It, they instead led to 
uh, an enormous collapse. We saw, you know, obviously trade union membership go into free fall and broadly, more, more broadly speaking, I would say um, a, a growing alienation and fragmentation and demoralization of working people. I don't say all this just to have a really botched history lesson, um, but because I think it's got direct relevance to how we understand the situation we're in at the moment. Um, because corporatism, if you read Leo Panitch in the 70s and 80s, was already pointing out this when this strategy was trying to be driven by social democratic parties. He was saying, wait a second, what this is doing is about integrating the leadership of social forces and demobilizing the base. It was about trying to access the vast masses of people who are part of these mass membership organizations um, via integrating the leadership of them and then winning sort of securing hegemony over those large layers of people who were part of these broadly speaking popular participatory structures and therefore securing social peace unfortunately not in the interests of working people but in the interests of the dominant class and the big corporations and billionaires i say the other reason why i talk about this is because um i think this new labor government is pursuing a strategy that you could sort of say is like a post corporatist one. They can't help but want to hark back to the good old days of the accord with their housing accord, the universities accord, but also the jobs and skills summit. Um, their deft, I think, integration of a lot of the environmental NGO leadership, um, their attempt at integrating the Greens via the balance of power, although, you know, I think that's uh, not working out so well for them at the moment. Um, post corporatism as sort of ensuring that um, the demobilized and alienated status quo is maintained because all of these leaderships of, of these kind of groups are sort of absorbed and any potential breakaway is brought back into this integrated uh, thing. And so you could call it a post corporatist uh, strategy that is intended to maintain um, a kind of demobilized and fragmented social uh, life amongst working people. But moving on to the second point, because this flows directly, is that actually, I think there's a silver lining to all of this. And that that means that, trans, that this sort of transformation that we want to see, that we need to see, is perhaps a lot closer. Because while the, the collapse that came about because of, say, the Accord, but also I think the um, the collapses that have come since, I think the collapse of the, the environmental movement in the 2000s and the anti-war movement, while they have led to deep alienation, demobilization and demoralization, it has also led to a weakening of the political structures that drove, for instance, that accord process in the first place. So people are at home, they're not mobilizing, but nor are they attached to the political establishment via those structures anymore. And that's the Achilles heel of of labor and this approach of, 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 of this integration is that the, the contradiction of corporatism is that the more successful it is, the more it loses its legitimizing power um, because it cleaves off, it demobilizes that base and they become disconnected from the leadership that was supposed to kind of integrate them into the establishment in the first place. I mean, did anyone really feel that the jobs and skills summit uh, with, you know, union representative attendance there um, really represented working people? Did, did working people even notice that it was happening? Uh, it seemed like a political class phenomenon, right? Um, and so today's post corporatism is, is this sort of funny thing because it's a sort of a corporatism without the people. It's sort of a spectacle of corporatism for the political class itself. Now, the flow on effect for all of this is a collapse in support for the major parties because they don't have that connective tissue between them and the masses of people. Um, and we've seen any data, if anybody looks at you know, the results of, that, of the last federal election is obvious, but any data that you, that you look at through like the ANU electoral survey and stuff shows this is free fall of people's particularly like um, loyal sort of vote for major parties. I think the loyal Labor voter is now less than 14% of the Australian population. And I think this kind of detachment of everyday people from, from politics um, is the kind of thing that makes me believe that rapid gains can in fact be made. And I'm talking over the next decade, the ability, the, the, the potential, if with the right strategy to, to rapidly change the political and social landscape, because the kind of old barriers are no longer there. And that sort of brings me to my next point, because the, the third, the third point that the task is now to win, because the primary barrier 
now is no longer people's belief in a, a sort of um, establishment uh, reform party like Labor um, or the Liberals for that matter, um, because they no longer have that connection to it. Um, that's no longer the, the problem here. People, you, you know, you go door knocking and it's not like people are like, oh yeah, we just can't wait for Labor to get in. You know, even at this federal election, that wasn't the case. Um, when people wanted to kick out the Liberals, it wasn't because they wanted to see Labor in. Um, people are, the, the main barrier today is that people are demoralized and they're demoralized. And I think we have to see people as rational here. Um, people are demoralized and they're not doing stuff politically and socially because they don't want to commit to something that will waste their time because they're rational, because people are rational, that people have to see wins. They have to see a relationship between an action that they take and the result that they want to see in the world. And so we have to win. And it's been part of the Queensland Greens sort of strategy it sounds dumb, but it's tr true, like trying to um, get some breakaway wins that open up space for more winning because it raises people's expectations about what is possible. And this means a few things, and this will kind of lead me to my conclusion. Um, three things. Firstly, that people are good. Um, Max made this point in a podcast that I did with him and Stuart Monkton a while back, that people are actually already good. The idea that a lot of the left seems to have is, is quite misanthropic. People are not problematic. They're not like complicit. They don't require moral correctives. Uh, and actually they have broadly the right perspective. Um, you know, you go out and door knock. I mean, my feeling is that door knocking uh, in the burbs or whatever, you just get so refreshed at how uh, on the money a lot of people are. Um, they don't need to be educated about how bad the system is. They don't need to have a lecture about capitalism. There's enough in the common sense of most Australians. Great, five minutes to go. I, I'll try to do it in three. Um, there's enough in the common sense of, like, of everyday Australians for us to find enough common ground to begin winning on a transformative universalist political platform. And as we win more, more pol people's politics will shift to a more coherent elaboration of that and understanding of what's, what would, it would take for their interests to be realized um, because they believe more in, this, in, a, in that kind of project and that politics capable of delivering on those things. Um, so, okay, so the second sort of upshot of this strategy is that people are at home. They're not coming along to lefty rallies. We all know that there's less and less, right? Um, and so you have to go to where they are and you have to do it at scale. In the campaign that I, I ran, Max Chandler made this campaign for Griffith um, this, uh, this election. Um, and we had 30,000 in-depth one-on-one conversations. That was our approach to winning that seat. Um, because we understood that that's where people are and you've just got to go there and you've got to have those conversations. Electoral politics, funnily enough, now is a weak point, I feel, for the establishment. It's a space where wins can be made quite rapidly, where huge resources can be um, accumulated and mo mobilised um, to win. And then once you win, you've secured a set of ongoing resources because an electorate office, especially a federal one, has quite a lot of resources to um, be, to, to begin to do other work. And you, Max Chandler Mather's office is such a fantastic example of this, where they're running free breakfast programs at a whole bunch of schools now. They're trying to start up some free lunch and free dinner projects uh, in sort of some of the poorer areas of the electorate. Um, they're running a lot of community campaigns and they're also sort of spearheading this um, fight to, to get something better out of these, these half negotiations and, and, a, and win a rent, rent freeze. Um, and finally, I'm sort of leading into this third point here is that we have to demonstrate it's not enough to just make an electoral win we have to also demonstrate that we can have a material impact on people's lives because we're not going to be in government anytime soon really i mean we joked about an 18-year plan for the for a greens government i actually feel that's now i don't think that's so crazy i think that's that's something that we should be trying to achieve um outs but but given that that's a way off we need to be able to firstly of course force conceptions out of labor while not being absorbed by the labor project so that we can say that we've we're sort of delivering stuff but also help fight help people fight 
to win material improvements in their local communities, whether that's a footbridge uh, to the, uh, over a creek that gets really badly flooded so kids have to walk through floodwaters, something that we're working on in, in the Ryan electorate, um, or you know, a better development in, the, in their area rather than the shit sandwich they've been given by the private developers. Um, or it's developing systems of mutual aid and social life that fill the gaps of the neoliberal state. And this is like coming back to the theme of this conference and this session around climate change. And I intentionally didn't want to make out like climate change fundamentally changes what we need to do, because in many ways it's just the same. It's just we feel more stressed about it. But climate change will make this aspect, I think, different in the sense that I think over the next decade or several decades, we will see the neoliberal state crack and be incapable of um, sort of uh, covering every gap that will emerge from the impacts of climate change, whether it's flooding, bushfires, um, sh shortages of food because of transportation problems and so on, is that there will, there will emerge more gaps that a social force, a political and social force, and I think this is what, you know, I think the Greens could become, um, can start to fill those gaps. And, and that builds more depth to the political project to give it more capacity to withstand the pressure, you know, the various pressures that the state and capital will try to bring to bear on it as we try to, as we sort of make more and more gains. And so that's the sort of part of that deeper um, approach that will need to be taken beyond just obviously winning electoral gains. And I don't need to say that to a room full of socialists that there's, you need to do more than just win um, in electoral uh, spaces. Um, but that would certainly be part of what would be needed to be done to build uh, a movement capable of making those transformations. So I guess um, I wanted to, despite going through a bit of a bleak uh, opening, I did want to end on that positive because I genuinely think that over this next decade or two, um, we just need to get incredibly organized and orient ourselves to everyday people, not to, uh, you know, obscure leftist uh, infighting, um, who's got more people at what rally, all those sorts of things that I think, unfortunately, dog the left. Um, and I think if, if we do have that orientation to maximum uh, massive contact with everyday people through door knocking and through organizing in people's communities, we can make these gains very quickly. Um, and I'll leave it there. Fantastic. Thanks, Liam. Our next speaker is Farouk Tariq. Revolution in the age of uh, climate emergency. Yes, that's what we need at present time. Nothing less than a revolution. Yesterday, we were talking about the growth. I was listening to Koi Koi Saito, and I was thinking what he's talking about. Growth, and then degrowth. And uh, because we are facing the challenge of uh, our, our main challenge is survival, not growth. Uh, I have seen people dying with the hunger, with poverty, with the, all the exploitation of capitalism, they, they could not survive. They just, I mean, young people dying uh, at the age of 25 with heart attacks and all that and so on, that's what the condition is. So I was thinking yesterday, I should ask him, if there is no growth, how could we go for degrowth? So we have to fight for growth in countries like uh, Pakistan, countries of the South. And also the term South, I have a bit doubt about it. Now, Saudi Arabia is also in South. Is Saudi Arabia a country where we would say that there is some uh, need for a revolution? Yes, we need more revolution in Saudi Arabia. But that country is one of the exploiter countries, not uh, one of the exploited countries uh, by the rich. Uh, hands in hand with the American imperialism, they are doing their best to keep Palestine uh, uh, slave in the hands of the 
uh, Israel and so on. And so are most of the uh, countries of, uh, of Middle East. Now, why we say that we need a revolution? Uh, that is because of the failure of capitalism in absolute terms. Uh, when we see capitalism working in countries like Pakistan, India, Bangladesh, Nepal, countries like South Asia, we see the revolution, uh, the need of revolution on every step. Uh, there is a feudalism, there is a domination of religion over the state. State is religious and people are curing cancer by going to fake doctors. Uh, so that sort of religion has uh, taken over the consciousness of the people. And the maximum age in Pakistan at this time is 64 years. So I have crossed that age already, so I am on bonus at present time. Uh, so is the case, uh, and if you see the maximum age of Japanese, which is nearly 90, so I, I said in one of the meetings, it's not because Japanese are more Muslim and we are less Muslims, it's the material condition in which Japanese are living and the material condition in which we are living. Because most of our women, when they are uh, giving birth of a child, they have never seen hospital. It's the local nurses, uh, the, the, not the trained nurses. Uh, most of the deliveries are taking place at homes, at, still at, at this place. And I have not seen a single, home, single family in Pakistan whose child has not died. Because the, uh, the, the death rate is almost 124 out of 1,000 before the age of five. That's the condition we are living. And we see all the old uh, illnesses in Pakistan. Polio is still there. Uh, you see malaria, tiptek. So you see uh, all these uh, 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 illnesses which has been wiped out from the countries of the north still persisting in Pakistan, uh, countries like Pakistan. Uh, so the, this failure, uh, where they have not ended poverty, inequalities are on rise. During Corona, there was 20 million new poor in Pakistan. Now in this present uh, crisis, Pakistan is becoming like Sri Lanka at present time. It's collapsing. It's like uh, defaulting. Anytime it could, uh, IMF has just signed a contract yesterday of 3 billion, but that will not even save uh, the economy which they are going through. The total reserve, foreign reserve of Pakistan, which is a country of nearly 20, 240 million people, is uh, only less than $4 billion. Uh, that's the condition at present time. And uh, so we see that almost every family has a death of a child uh, in this condition. So when this um, corona came, it was... To, uh, 20 million new poor, and in this present crisis, another 10 million new poor in Pakistan uh, who have crossed the line of poverty to the other side, not to the positive side, but to the negative side. So in this background, when nine, uh, 11 months ago, there was a, uh, a climate disaster in Pakistan, when seven days of consistent rains and flood came together. It all started in Balochistan. We have a friend sitting here from Koita who has witnessed all that uh, uh, climate uh, disaster. So consistent seven days rain meant water everywhere. It started in Balochistan. It went over to, uh, to Sindh. And I went after three months of uh, this disaster, still, it was water everywhere. All the crops were destroyed. Uh, only one of the main road you can go through. But you see here, there is like uh, uh, the sea has uh, uh, taken over the land. Uh, on the both sides of, uh, of the main road, it was like this. And uh, in, in that uh, climate disaster, uh, we, had, uh, we are still, even after 11 months, we have 1.8 million people living in tents 
at this time. It was 4.5 million people who were living in tents were now been reduced. 1,700 people were killed. 1.2 million livestock was killed. We saw goats running in the water. Uh, the, the farmers could not do anything. It, it is gone in front of them. Uh, I had a friend who had a, a fish farm. I said, where is your fish farm? He said, this is all fish farm. <laughs> it's all over, you know. I said, where your fish has gone? He said, they have run away, you know. <laughs> because it's all water. It's all water there. And he still could not rebuild his fish farm because water is still there. So that sort of a disaster has taken place at the time. 7.9 million people were displaced and around 3 to 4 percent of GDP loss. Most of the crops and fruits particularly. Normally fruits come from Balochistan to Pakistan. It's all uh, grapes and uh, apples uh, and it comes from Afghanistan, then from Balochistan, then to Lahore. And during this uh, crisis, I saw nearly 30 to 40 kilometers long lines of trucks full of fruit, rottening. Food was rottening because they could not move further. It was uh, all the roads were collapsed. There was no road left. It was all water all, all over. So that sort of damages took place in Pakistan. And what was the response internationally and locally? People survived. There was not, ma not many killed. Um, if you see proportion of the disaster because of the local help. Many, many people brought food. Immediate, they cooked food at home and went to the area. It was, they did not wait for the state to help and come, uh, come and help them. So a lot of food, uh, food distribution took place. We immediately, when we saw the rains uh, in Balochistan, we immediately set up a camp in Lahore Mall Road, which is the main road of Lahore, and we started collecting funds. And we were able to send the first truck of food items within two days uh, uh, to Dera Ghazi Khan, which, was, which is also close by uh, to Blochistan. And uh, then we have to send more uh, onwards. Uh, so it was mainly, uh, but we were sending dry food because they could not cook inside. There was no, nothing left to cook. So it was mainly dry fruit uh, we, and dry food which we, we were sending at the time. It was a local help of uh, unprecedented level that saved the life. Internationally, there was a lot of talk. Uh, UN uh, repertoire came, UN Secretary General came. He made very good speeches. Uh, Angelina Jolie came. She, <laughs> ma she made the visits. It was like uh, a disaster tourism. And they came and looked at the disaster and made good speeches, but nothing came in practical terms to Pakistan. And, and then there was a COP27 at Sharmul Sheikh in Egypt, uh, where I went to attend. It was a bloody expensive place, $300 a night. That's what uh, you have to pay over there, uh, $10 for a coffee. So I was offered free coffee because of my good speech at one place, <laughs> which went viral. And so Pakistani star said, you can come and have some food and so on. So in, in, in this background, there was a loss and damage contract by COP27 at Sharmul Sheikh last year. And this was the effort of this uh, social activist and also the effort of the Pakistani government, which did their best. They were doing to get some money to repay the loans. They were not trying their best to get money for the rehabilitation of the flood victims. All they were occupied how to repay the foreign loan, how to avoid the default. People are defaulted already. Pakistanis defaulted already because there is not much left for the people to survive. So these, this Sharmul Sheikh effort in a country ruled by a dictator, Sisi, uh, that was not much in practice. Till today, 
not a single penny has come to Pakistan. All the promises of UN, only 20% was uh, collected, and rest is just promises. So a lot of promises by the rich countries, but they did not pay. We demand reparations. We say the, uh, the colonization of Indian subcontinent, you have to pay back. And it's the climate disaster did not come because of us. Pakistan is only contributing 1%, less than 1% of the total. India is contributing very little. Even China is contributing very little. It's the Americans, it's the European Union, it's the Australians, it's the Canadians, these bloody rich nations. They have, uh, uh, they have gone for this industrial growth without taking care of the environment. Uh, they have polluted our environment. We, there is more heat at this time. The temperature has gone up. This is because of these industrialized country. And they are not ready to pay back uh, the damages they have created for the whole world. That's where we say we need reparation. We don't need even loss and damages. We need reparations. We need the historical debt you have to pay to us. The loot and plunder you have carried out du during colonization, that has to be paid back. That's our demand. And that's why we say we need revolution. We don't need reforms. We don't need little help. We don't need uh, 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 something to, to survive for a while. We need to have a complete change. Because look at, less than 1% is spent on education in Pakistan. Less than 1% is spent on health and education. And over 55% of the total budget was allocated to repay the foreign loans. We are paying to the loans who are already very rich. IMF doesn't need our money. American doesn't need our money. Chinese bank doesn't need our money. We need that money for our people. But that money has been repaid. $12 billion was paid by the Pakistani government in a few months. They want now, uh, they have a contract of $3 billion. So to get $3 billion, they paid $12 billion. That's the wisdom of our ruling classes at this time. They are making everything more expensive. Electricity, 200% more expensive. Oil, they have uh, uh, withdrawn all subsidies on gas and oil and so on. Even vegetables are expensive. Chicken has become very expensive. The uh, mutton you only eat at the Eid al Zuhar when the Eid is just gone. I have seen thousands of family waiting for this Eid day so they could get some meat to eat. People, even dal, the lentils, have become so expensive. 500 rupees a kilo. You know in India it, it might be 300, 200, 100, but Pakistan has become like an experiment of the new liberal agenda where people are paying the price of all the expenditures which has been sent out of Pakistan because of the uh, uh, ruling classes strategies uh, that they should not default. So in this background, we say this is climate emergency and this is a time for revolution. And we need a socialist revolution. We need to overthrow capitalism. But to overthrow capitalism, we have to build our organizations. We have to build our parties, like our friends from India, who has won 10 seats uh, uh, in one of the state. Uh, they are fighting back again and again. And that's what we are trying to do in Pakistan. We need a united front of socialists, of uh, Marxists, to push back the onslaught of the new liberal uh, internationally. Thank you. Thanks so much, Farooq. Our final speaker is Susan. Thanks, comrades. Well, I guess one thing we can all agree on at this conference is that capitalism and its rapacious drive for profit and new markets is driving us to the brink towards climate catastrophe and potentially war. The question is, how do we get from where we are right now to where we know we need to be to bring about a democratic, ecologically sustainable, safe climate future for all, free from oppression and exploitation? 
Well, discussing revolutionary strategy in the age of climate emergency requires us to recognise the existential threat that's posed by cli the climate emergency and also the other deeply interconnected ecological um, and social crises. As Kohei Saito put it yesterday, we're in the time of polycrisis. The economic and ecological crises of capitalism are interconnected with a crisis of democracy, and we can see that those crises are accelerating. We've seen this rise in global inequality, which was made much worse by the COVID-19 pandemic, and the poorest states were hit the hardest. The pandemic itself was the result of capitalism's destruction of the biosphere. Then there's the ecological crisis, which I think Farouk has illustrated in, in great detail the displacement of millions of people in many parts of the globe due to it becoming uninhabitable, due to drought, heat, flood and sea rise. And this crisis in turn is fueling wars over resources becoming scarcer and scarcer. The situation in sub-Saharan Africa today is dire. Kenya, Nigeria, Ethiopia and Somalia are facing the worst food crisis in 40 years due to climate change and conflict. And it's almost certain that we're likely to reach 1.5 degrees Celsius of global warming by the end of this decade. And we have a new generation growing up with the threat of nuclear war hanging over their heads. Not just wars far away, but the threat is in our region. And clearly, without an eco-socialist revolution, humanity faces two terrible prospects. Rapid extinction from nuclear conflagration or accelerating climate collapse. But I guess faced with this future, we also need to be clear that green capitalism is not going to provide the answer. We need eco-socialism. And as Peter Boyle mentioned yesterday, capitalism on 100% renewables is just a false dream. We need to ask ourselves, um, who do we want in control of the transition? The capitalist class or the working class? Right now, you know, in the Northern Territory, we've got um, Mike Cannon Brooks and Twiggy Forest, you know, with their plans to build their solar farm to export solar energy to Singapore via a huge undersea cable. That's, that is green capitalism. Or Rahana, who mentioned yesterday in the opening panel in the Philippines, the plan to transition the country's jeepney fleet to electric vehicles is being used by the Philippines uh, capitalist class as a pretext for privatising owner-operated public transport, um, costing many jobs. So can we leave the transition to the mining magnates and the green tech billionaires to agribusiness? I don't think so. In the hands of the capitalist class, the transition is likely to mean many more false market solutions. Carbon markets, green profiteering, green extractivism, mass unemployment and dislocation. At worst, mass deaths and displacement in the global south and in the so-called sacrifice zones. And we saw what happened during COVID-19, the level of disaster capitalist profiteering that went on. The way out of the crises must be anti-capitalist. We can't solve the crisis without changing the system. And even the climate scientists are recognising this. Well, to win that eco-socialist future, we urgently need to build red-green alliances, not just around immediate struggles, but also around a revolutionary eco-socialist perspective that's internationalist in its character. So this means working together on the ground and it's good to have Liam join us today. Building mass movements for refugee rights against racism, for housing, climate action, to challenge the power of the fossil fuel interests against the neoliberal attacks. We know climate change and war are creating millions of refugees. And this is fertile ground for the far right to pursue its own agenda of racist scapegoating of migrants in the name of protecting borders or national interests. And this, uh, this movement has also got to be for the rights of oppressed peoples um, and the peoples of the global south, the poorer nations, who are still carrying, as Farouk has just pointed out, the burden of crippling debt, adding to the theft, the historic theft of resources over centuries of colonisation. 
So making the connections between these struggles and the fight for an eco-socialist future is essential because it also is about, you know, building the movements now is about building the confidence of our class and the strength in organisation of our class for the challenges ahead. So we need to find agreement on an eco-socialist, a revolutionary eco-socialist perspective, which means we, we need to also talk about the limitations of democracy under capitalism and the need for popular power, for people's power, for class power, however you want to talk about it. We've got to unite around immediate issues, but also, well, what is our goal here? For example, there's been lots of discussion about Green New Deals, but what that means depends a lot on what your perspective is. Um, is it a process, you know, to set out immediate reforms as part of a broader fight for a post-capitalist future, or is it the end game in itself? I think for us, in this room, the future needs to be post-capitalist. And I, I guess this does throw out a bit of a challenge to, to the Greens, our comrades in the Greens, um, and is a, bit, is a call to work with the left. I think it's not just enough to, to talk in radical terms and then marginalise the left. I think it was great to hear from uh, Jordan Steele-John in the opening panel that he welcomes the opportunity to work with the left against AUKUS, against militarism and the anti-China war drive. Well, what more can we do around building a red-green alliance to tackle the climate emergency, the social consequences of neoliberal capitalism, in solidarity with our brothers and sisters in the poorer nations, in the oppressed nations. The struggle for eco-socialism, as I think as we as socialists understand it, requires a revolutionary mobilisation of the working class to overthrow capitalism, but we know that such a mobilisation won't be possible in the age of climate crisis around some kind of narrow model of just redistribution. Um, it has to take on the broader crises of late capitalism. We have to struggle to fundamentally change the system of production and consumption. And we also need independent class struggle that's not beholden to the interests of the capitalist parties. And it, this cannot just be a struggle around economic issues either. It's not just about a bigger piece of the pie. We want to bake a new pie. You know, we want to talk about wealth, but what do we actually regard as the wealth of a society? And what has the creation of that wealth historically cost the planet and people to produce? Biodiversity loss, global warming, species extinction, wars over resources, just to name a few of those costs. And I think we need to recognise Marx's clarity that we can't just seize the means of production and carry on. But also the clarity that Marx provides that the working class is the central force um, in that change. And we need to get serious about, about this, about that class mobilisation. So we've got to build alliances, engage with different sections of society. As, as Liam said, we've got to go to where people are, um, not wait for them to come to us. But we also need multi-level alliances with various levels of, of civil society, um, mass organisations and so on. And we recognise the massive disillusionment that's out there. Um, particularly with the capitalist parties. They don't offer solutions, so, of course, there's the mass dissolution out there and demobilisation, as Liam rightly put it, thanks to, you know, years of the accord, class collaboration, but also the impacts of COVID. I think we have to acknowledge the lack of action on climate change and the capturing of a section of the climate movement um, by labour and uh, by the NGOs, or a capture of the NGOs. We, we certainly need a vision for an alternative future in order to mobilise and inspire people. And I think as part of this strategy, electoral, electoral tactics are very important. I think, you know, we can certainly use seats as a platform and a resource for the movements. And certainly we want to do more of that kind of work um, uh, in building the movements, drawing on those resources that the Greens have built up but also hopefully that socialist uh, representatives can also um, provide. And certainly for Socialist Alliance, our local councillors um, have used their positions, I think, quite well, and we've got a new one sitting here next to me. Yeah. Uh, we'll, look, we'll look forward to uh, 
to, to the kind of, you know, local organising that Sarah will be doing alongside uh, community activists. I think in Australia it's important for us to build a, an, on a discussion in the labour movement about the question of jobs, the energy transition, the housing crisis and especially the war drive and AUKUS. A, militant, a new militant working class current in this country can't just be based solely on industrial militancy. I think part of this is recognising and, if you like, having the conversations about the interconnectedness of the crises, but moving beyond a narrow economist or economic agenda. The Australian working class and unions and other class formations need to be concerned with the ecology, with energy production and consumption, with housing, with war, with oppression and solidarity. We need to give life back to the slogan of no jobs on a dead planet. It's still very relevant. And we've got to have those often difficult discussions with workers about this. I think the work that's going on in just transitions communities, like in the Hunter Valley, for example, in and around Geelong, are good examples of this. But we also need to take on false ideas that the war drive and the global arms trade is going to create some kind of jobs boom in Australia. Given especially that the coalition, of coalition and Labor both have a project of inserting Australia into the global market for weapons production and trade. And we also need to have the discussions about how war fuels climate change, not just through destruction of habitat, but also through the military industrial complex. Together we've got to pose sustainable and lasting job creation solutions and vision through meeting housing needs, building more hospitals, schools, infrastructure and services to remote communities, renewable energy infrastructure, public transport. Of course, these, these could happen via, you know, projects like eco-socialist eco Green New Deals, for example. I'm not ruling that out um, as part of a process of building, uh, building alliances, um, organisation and confidence. And I think in doing this, we're not about sowing illusions in green capitalism, but pointing towards a complete overhaul of industry services, including the question of public ownership and workers' control of industry. In other words, fundamentally challenging the systems of production and distribution under capitalism in this country. Well, a working class or eco-socialist revolution can't simply take hold of the forces and of production and to each give a happier lot, as we like to sing, um, which, you know, might mean more or better stuff, for example. Because, we, as we know, these forces are distorted um, because of capitalism's systemic robbery of labour and nature, and Kohei Saito talked about this in length. Capitalist commodity production and the drive for profit is wrecking the planet and impoverishing humanity and literally killing it in wars. Under capitalism, GDP or economic growth is regarded as the measure of prosperity. Capitalist culture is all about convincing us that a life of accumulation is the best life we can live. Encouraging transactional relationships between human beings or limiting our role to that of consumer alienated from what we consume, from nature, from other people. Do we simply want to continue that way of life? No. <laughs> I think the concept of buen vivir, good and sustainable living, if comrades haven't heard of it before, is useful here. It's become very popular in Latin America. Um, if you want to look up the Margarita Declaration from 2014, um, it, it goes through the concept of buen vivir, of good and sustainable living. I won't go into it now. It's basically defined as living well, feeling good and respecting the cycles of nature and Mother Earth. And importantly, the Margarita Declaration also asserts the inalienable right of the peoples to be protagonists in the construction of their own destinies, which is an, a very important addition. I think we do need to redefine what we mean by a good life today, particularly in the, in the global north, um, where, you know, rampant consumption is, is causing the problem. A safe climate, safe and secure housing for life, universal free and accessible health care and education from cradle to grave, free public transport, more free time to spend with family and friends, time and space for creativity, for real participatory democracy, fulfilling our potential as human beings, 
restoring our connectedness with nature, listening to and walking on country. And we also need to transition agriculture and food production to regenerative practices, even in large-scale farming. It's less work in the long run, more productive, and puts back into the soil what's taken out. And when we talk about seizing the means of production, we also want to seize the means of production and destruction, and in many cases, in order to close them down, while at the same time guaranteeing people's livelihoods and their right to a good life. And I think also on this question of the distortions, the divide between the rich and poor countries is part of this. And the climate emergency poses the necessity for degrowth in the imperialist countries. The enrichment of the global north has been made possible by the theft of resources from the south or the poorer countries. The debt burden keeps these countries in a state of underdevelopment while workers in the global north benefit. We know the world's wealthiest countries in the G20 are responsible for about 80% of global greenhouse gas emissions. And we know that the global north is going to owe something like $192 trillion to the global south, so-called, in climate reparations by 2050. So it's a very practical question. The rich have to undergo degrowth of some kind. The projections that global GDP growth will go from 2.7% this year to 2.9% next year means we're on track to use up our climate budget. And that's the amount of carbon dioxide emissions to keep warming below 1.5 degree Celsius within the decade. So we have to talk about degrowth in the imperialist countries. But this doesn't mean eco-socialism is calling for a decline in living standards for the working class because we can have a better life with degrowth by rebuilding what author Jason Hickel talks about as being the new commons. Public housing, free healthcare, education and a radically shorter working week. We need to move to socially useful production rather than production for exchange, to move to a solidarity economy. And we have a need for a radical reorganisation of work around models of workers' control, including cooperatives, we reject, you know, the expansion of jobs like the gig economy, for example, that are based on super exploitation of workers and precariousness and underpaid workers. And there's a lot that we can learn from the experiments in workers' control and cooperatives in Latin America and Spain. We're not just talking about individual enrichment of workers through profit, but looking at the workplace, for example, as part of a community, contributing to the well-being of the community as a whole the creation, if you like, of a social surplus product um, where you have good working conditions, safety, security, and where, where wealth can be redistributed throughout the community, not just in one workplace, and where workers make decisions about what to produce and how much. And this new kind of work is a way to free people up from labour, which would allow for a radical expansion of grassroots and direct democracy. And this is my final point, Sarah. We can learn also the experiences of the Rojava revolution uh, that Nilifer spoke about yesterday, m about multi-ethnic and women's participation at all levels of society, or the Chavista communal council experiments and communes, um, and especially the work being done today in dealing creatively with the economic blockade imposed by the United States through self-organisation at the commune level. We also need to get past the social democratic leanings and practices of this idea of representative democracy, but also the bureaucratic leanings, the idea of top-down um, processes that still inhabit the left. And we need to move to a popular power vision or protagonism, as Marta Haneke described it. This is my final, final point. <laughs> The stakes are high, comrades. Uh, as Liam said, socialism or barbarism, or perhaps updated for today, we want to talk about eco-socialism or extinction. These are not empty phrases. I mean, Marx and Engels, writing in the Communist Manifesto, said that in the history of class struggle, the fight between the oppressor and oppressed either ends in a revolutionary reconstitution of society or in the common ru ruin of the contending classes. And this should give added urgency to our efforts to build a movement that's powerful enough to take on the capitalist class and to bring about an eco-socialist future. Thanks.
Thanks so much, Susan. I'm um, going to join me in thanking all our speakers again, Liam, Farouk, Susan. Some great presentations, comrades. And I was very lenient with my slack 15 minutes, but we got lots out of it. Um, we probably only have about 10 minutes for discussion. Alex is waving at me, so we've got some questions online. Oh, you're indicating. Okay. Well, Alex, come over here then. Um, come right down the front. And Sam, and if we keep it quick, we might get another round of three. So can those... So down the front and Sam, if you want to come over here as well, so you're ready to go. Uh, hi, everyone. I think... Um, uh, I, I come from Brisbane, um, and I think it's actually very... What the Greens have done in Brisbane is incredibly impressive, and I just don't think anybody here should underestimate that. And I think that is actually very important for us to have a... Like, you know, th this is actually a very important discussion, um, I think, between socialists and this left-wing current in the sort of South Brisbane Greens. Like, you know, I don't know, you could exaggerate it, but potentially this is the, this is the kind of thing that could actually change the future of the country. Um, and I, I guess I, you know... I mean, at the same time, I do think there are limits to what's happening in the Queensland Greens as well. I think there's two sides to it. But um, I guess I've actually got, first of all, a question for Susan. And I guess, actually, I'm actually wondering if Susan would address the point that Leah made, which I don't know that was probably not, not addressed as much as I would like in, um, in Susan's talk, about the question of, um, you know, working class action. You know, it's, it's very easy to make rhetoric about the need for socialism change, you know, blah, blah, blah. You know, but actually for, for you know... To, to actually get to, to, to create the environment in which ordinary working class people can take action in their own, in their own interests, that's actually the essence of what we're trying to get to here. And I'd be interested to hear Susan's response to, to what Liam said. And I think, for, I mean, just to, to illustrate that, um, I think like right now, this housing debate that's happening in, in Australian politics, um, you know, there, are, uh, there are a whole lot of Labor Party, you know, Labor stands, as they say. Um, that are basically, you know, putting up all these ridiculous arguments against what you know, the very simple and modest proposals the Greens are putting forward on housing. Um, and, you know, I, I put up an article on Green F recently and someone put on my, on my Facebook, oh, look, oh, this isn't revolutionary, blah, blah, blah. It's like there's no revolutionary path of actually that doesn't go through defending what the Greens are doing on this housing debate. Um, you know, for example, like, that's part of our basic bread and butter is we need to defend what they're doing because that's a good thing. So, so I've got a question. That's my question for Susan. But I also have a question for Liam. And I, and I guess my question for Liam is about, is about the question of protest in particular. Like, I interviewed Max chandler Mather a, a few months ago, and I asked him about protesting on the housing front. And to be honest, I was a bit disappointed about w with his answer, which was a bit dismissive, I thought, of, of protest action. And I think, I mean, and to me, to my way of thinking, when the... When the, when the um, the negotiations were going on between Labor and the Greens about the safeguard mechanism. It was crying out for there to be a national day of action against all new coal and gas. And, OK, fair, the Greens pointed out that ACF and a whole lot of other climate groups didn't do it, but also the Greens didn't do it. And, frankly, I guess I feel like the Greens are probably in a situation where they would have been in the position to actually initiate a, a, a kind of a protest action that would have had sufficient weight to actually, you know, even if not you know, necessarily, you know, shift Labor all the way, but at least, you know, begin to sort of change the balance of forces and point towards what's, uh, what's more necessary. And, and so, I mean, like, I mean, Liam talked about, like, you know, sort of building up a social support base, and the Greens are definitely doing that, but I'm, I'm interested in particular on the question of protest in particular, because that's how you get, that's how you get change. That's how you overthrew the dictators in Egypt. That's how we actually won all the things that we've, that we've seen. My name is Sajad. I'm from Pakistan. Currently, I, it's been eight months since I came here in Melbourne. So I've been working as an architect for the uh, past seven years, uh, making houses of the rich. <laughs> so uh, back there in Pakistan, we used to call them like the agents of the international capital. <laughs> So uh, while Pakistan is defaulting, uh, we heard the news of a Pakistani billionaire drowning uh, yes. after paying $250,000 to see the ruins of Titanic. So uh, one thing that I, I'll, I'll be asking Suzanne uh, a question, uh, I think it's more relevant to ask her. 
So as an architect and training in urban design, and the difference that I felt is coming here in Melbourne, in the so-called developed world, uh, is that, that I've noticed that in the, in the developing world, where I come from, and there are still uh, like uh, remains of what we called uh, the, the, the organic growth of cities and, and the, what do you say, the traditional cities as they existed, which, were, uh, which, which grew uh, on de facto basis. They were not designed by some architects. So they were designed back in the days uh, at the scale of the human being, not for the automobile. So the people in the developed world, uh, they seem, it seems to me that they are more connected and something, if something happens to them, they cry, they show solidarity. And sometimes even if you see in the past 50 years or so, you have seen that uh, there have been uh, drastic changes as well. They have toppled their governments as well in the develop, uh, developing world. But you don't see that in countries like uh, America or Australia. So for me, as, an, uh, as a student of urban design, it seems to me that uh, the design of the cities uh, in, in, in North America and Australia, it are so, uh, in, it are, they are such that the people have been alienated and the design is uh, a disciplinarian design that People can't like gather to to make a public performance, like a show of people's power. So, like you're discussing revolution. So, how will that come about? Like in in countries like uh, in the developed world, the more powerful people world, because when you elect a government or change the system in a developing country, and you topple the, the agents of international capital, they get, a, get support from, from Uncle Sam, and they are brought back yes. right, uh, right after they are toppled, or, some, or the faces change. So how do we do that here in the developed, in the more industrialized world, so we can have solidarity from here for the uh, developing countries? And all that what you said. Thank you. Thanks a lot to the speakers. Really great stuff. Uh, so first a quick comment and then a question, which I guess is to, 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 to Liam and, uh, and, and Susan. First, when we talk about ecological transformation, off, you know, uh, this, is, this is a point I got from Peter down there when we were on a, on a train trip a while ago, is that when we talk about... Uh, a sustainable transition and a sustainable economy uh, and sustainable jobs, we often think in terms of, you know, what, what are the oil workers going to do instead of being oil workers or that, that sort of thing, which is, which, is, which is part of the story. But more fundamentally, a trans, especially in the, in the global north where we do need deep growth, is it's going to mean a lot of us doing different kinds of work. You think about the, the transition that we need is going to, uh, if it's connected to social justice, is going to mean a lot more people working in caring professions and doing it with love. That's, that's where we need free, people freed up to work, you know? And, and, we, all, and we know that's about um, making the work of social reproduction the responsibility of the whole of society. Um, and with agriculture as well, I mean, I find it hard to imagine that sustainable agriculture is not going to need a lot more human labour than it currently does. You know, and so we have to accept that you know a, a transition in the in the north is actually going to mean a lot more labour-intensive work in some areas, and, and deploying the tel technology in the places where you know we don't want machines looking after old people and people with disabilities. We want humans to do it with love, like I said. You know, okay. Now my, my next thing is about ta you know is, is is about tactics or strategy and tactics in Australia. Um, and so I've got some sort of comments for for Liam in particular, which. Uh, 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 so partly criticisms, I suppose, but but it meant in the value of you know, it meant in the spirit of of, of wanting real engagement because I have no question that that left moving anti capitalist greens are going to be part of the anti capitalist political force that we need to build in this future in this country. Now Liam sort of made a bit of a comment about sort of you know the lefty rallies aren't really you know you know aren't mass politics that sort of stuff, and I think we should be careful about sort of 
being too sort of, you know, sort of cynical, uh, you know, in, in comments about those sorts of things for two reasons. One is we should never have a crack at people having a go and trying to do things. Even if it's the umpteenth rally of 100 people, and I've been to lots of them where you know half the people there and you've already heard the speakers, um, and, I mean, and I've been one of them, right? So that, that's, you know, <laughs> that's, so that, that's true. But also think about the recent rally that happened in Sydney of public housing tenants. So it wasn't just, you know, the inner city left 100 people doing the rally. It, the rally probably wasn't huge, but tenants themselves who had organised an occupation of their housing were part of the rally. So what's really important, it doesn't matter whether, if it's a rally or, or, or it's a raffle or it's a film night. It, when we talk about we need street action, we need protest action, I mean, that, that's kind of shortcutting the fact is what's really important is people's experience of self-organisation. That's what's really valuable. Um, and that doesn't matter if it's 30 people or 100 people or 1,000 people, let alone, let alone hundreds of thousands of people. So in that sense, I think probably I have a bit of, like, uh, if I'm mischaracterising the situation, then I know Liam will, will, will set me straight. But I think sometimes I've heard from the, the comrades in the, in the South Queensland Greens a little bit of the idea that, you know, we're not yet strong enough to be able to do the sort of the street action. We've just got to sort of build up our profile, do the door knocking, and then there'll be some point in the future. Uh, where we can engage with that, whereas I don't, I don't think it works that way. I think it's got to be everything at once. Yes. I'm really sorry, comrades. For the sake of people's stomachs and time, it's 5.25, so we're just going to hand it back to um, our panellists to wrap up. Now, Liam, I think you've probably got a bit to respond to, so do you want to have um, first crack and then we'll go to our other panellists? Sarah, and thanks for the questions, um, Alex and Sam. <clears throat> and look, I was, you know, intentionally provocative. I knew the audience that I would be speaking to here. Um, on the, it seems like protests or my comments around rallies was a bit of a like sticking point, perhaps. Um, I, I guess what I'm, what we're responding to uh, in the South Brisbane Greens is. Um, rallies that are kind of like a sort of kind of knee jerk or like unthinking tactic that just gets deployed regardless of the issue, regardless of whether they're going to be effective, no sense of how it's going to build to the next thing, no idea of how it might build further capacity for, uh, you know, everyday people. Um, and to the point where I feel like normal people rocking up at protests more, more often than not um, have a demoralizing and demobilizing experience because it doesn't get the outcome that they want and it signals of how few people really are coming out for this sort of a thing and so I'm not a, I, I think absolutely mass street demonstrations and continuous ones um, will be an important part of the kind of social and frankly social conflict um, that is going to have to happen if we're going to make the transformation that we need but it, but I do think that you need to have a, a clear idea about how to get to the um, scale that needs to be um, achieved for them to have an impact and that doesn't mean that you have to go from zero to uh you know 500,000 people but it does mean that if you're organizing in that space where you're trying to organize street demonstrations or something like that you have to think very critically about what is coming out of this action what is going to be followed up from that action, who's going to be called, like what phone calls are going to be made, how many more people are going to come onto the list for that campaign, how are they going to be sold a message that that rally was actually important, somehow made a difference for them to come back next time, for them to be recruited to call their friends or to call a call list of the people you have. You know, it's that sort of campaign uh, organising thinking that I feel when I was involved in, in those sorts of things, I felt was, in retrospect, I didn't know at the time because I didn't didn't really know better but like I feel is lacking in that space and then I want to speak to that idea about everything all at once Sam because that was my impression and, and you know it's a bit of a criticism of Susan's presentation as much as I agree with the with the politics of, of all, almost all of it was this idea that like we need this we need that we need a you know military trade union movement we need an electoral front we need a you know mass street demonstrations we need mutual aid it's like sure we need a lot of things what's our starting point 
where's the weak point in the, the terrain that we're in where we can start to make some gains so that we can accumulate the resources so that we can start to roll out in other spaces. It's, we, we, we've said these speeches for decades and unless we get our heads together around how we're actually gonna make those steps forward, we're gonna keep making these speeches as things get worse. So we have to be very, very clear about this and the everything at once rhetoric is really dangerous. So that's my response to, to that. In terms of the protests around unique moments of um, legislative conflict, you know, around the safeguard mechanism and so on, I, I guess my point would be that firstly, look, I'm not going to, I'm not here to either defend or, or say that, um, or, or critique the Greens approach to the safeguard mechanism. I think there's definitely worthy critiques that can be made. Um, but I think that, look, the, the, the federal party, the, the Greens are on a journey at the moment, and it's an exciting journey where they're learning and developing strategy to how, for how to deal with this new political terrain. And we didn't get the outcome really that we should have been able to get, I feel, from the safeguard stuff. But it's not for some kind of like original sin of the Greens for being, you know, not enough about rallies and not, you know, a bit liberal reformistic or stuff. It's because, yeah, the balance of forces in society was way off. And because I don't think we'd necessarily matured and, and sort of thought through it, had the infrastructure in the party and so on to roll out the kind of thing that we would need to extract more concessions, which I think we're in the process of doing through this housing stuff, which the, ent the entire purpose is to be able to bring to bear more weight on these sorts of um, situations. And I would say that the probably the reasons why protests are still not being organized in this space is because we don't want to put for like organize something that takes an enormous amount of resources if you're going to build a big rally and it to not be big enough and for it to look like we're small, like we have less uh, clout in like there's less weight behind it. Um, because we know that to, to draw that many people out, it's going to be hard. So I don't think anyone's opposed to it. It's just a matter of like, how do you, um, people, like while we're also organizing door knocking, because that's critical that we're door knocking in marginal labor seats to put the pressure on the labor party. And so it's like, it's a capacity issue and it's a kind of tactics and um, infrastructure issue. It's not a, it's not some ideological uh, disagreement with the need for that sort of stuff. It's just, we can't do everything all at once we can't and that's it i actually have to run really really soon because i've got a baby uh next door who's uh getting very cranky <laughs> and i need to relieve uh his mum. so I, I can stick around for just a moment to hear some other responses but i'm gonna have to pop off sorry all good thanks liam I think building of social movement is absolutely necessary in the present time. And building of parties are also very good, and uh, we are continuing to do that effort. But parties would be only built when there are social movements built around the issues which people are facing. For instance, uh, uh, on the climate issue, uh, there is an international movement uh, which is taking place uh, almost in every country, and people are protesting again and again uh, we started this uh, landless peasantry movement in Pakistan for fair compensation uh, for, the, uh, for, for the flood victims. But sometimes we are just uh, stuck to the party consciousness. We don't go, we doesn't go further than the party consciousness that yes, how many recruits we have to do it and how many uh, support we have got from here. But more importantly than this, in this period, uh, we need to build the social movements. Yeah, thanks for the questions, comrades. Um, I mean, I guess just speaking as someone who was a delegate and activist in the trade union sector for a couple of decades, in terms of organ... I think the question of organisation is essential. I mean, jumping, jumping on an issue in the workplace, for example, when it happens, um, people learn... Well, people in general feel so disempowered that they need to find a pathway in to actually becoming more active and building their confidence um, as, as workers, certainly in a, in, the, in a trade union, in a job scenario. 
And so if you, you know, you take up an issue on the job, you call a, a, a meeting of your workmates to discuss it and then you organise and decide together democratically what you're going to do about it. And that's like sort of 101, I guess. But I, I suppose what we're talking about here is something on a much broader scale. But for example, the campaign in Geelong around the library closures is another classic example of how, you know, we don't want to think about working class organisation in some kind of a narrow sense. That a community response to council budget cuts, which are going to see the closure of a library, and our role as socialists in terms of jumping in and helping to build uh, an organised, you know, democratically run, participatory uh, response to what's going on is, you know, is key. And I guess we've just, you know, we've got to think about how we would then scale that up. I mean, in certain points in our history, you know, for example, the refugee rights movement when, you know, it was at its peak... You know, at the right time, a call for a rally wouldn't just draw, you know, 50, 100 people onto the street. You'd get thousands. Um, and we've also seen in Australia the climate justice movement, um, the marches for climate, where we weren't just getting 500, 1,000, even 2,000 on the streets, but we're talking about 10, 20,000 people marching um, down the streets in Sydney. I think the, the, the limitations of that were that, you know... I think because of the weight of the NGOs, for a variety of reasons, there wasn't able to be built a sustained mass climate movement that, um, out, of that, uh, out of that. And I suppose that's the challenge for us now, is this question of building united fronts, as Farouk mentioned, um, but also building democratic mass movements that involve broad forces, you know, that bring Greens, socialists, climate activists uh, into the room um, to organise that we don't just organise under our party banner, but that we're actually looking to, to uh, organise and unite in alliance with others. And, you know, and people, you know, people who... The amount of people you talk to at protests, especially the big ones around black deaths in custody, I know during the COVID lockdown, when you'd have chats with people who said, this is the first time I've ever come to a protest, and then you, you begin to realise... I mean, Liam's right, the left is small and we are marginalised. And, we, and we, we fail, if we fail to recognise that, we do it at our peril because it's true. We, we need to understand that. But we've got to connect with where workers are moving into action. That's the key. We can't just sit um, and dictate from tactics from the sidelines. But I guess when there are those opportunities there to build mass movements, we've got to fight for them to be open, to be democratic in their internal functioning, um, if they're actually going to win. If we're going to talk about winning, then they've got to be open, democratic, mass... Uh, well, as mass as we can build them. You know, we want to build them uh, um, into mass... Uh, effective mass movements. Um, just the, the comrade... Uh, who asked the question about urban planning in Australia. I mean, there's, there's certainly a movement in urban planning that is very much consciously against providing public space for people to assemble. And in fact, in the post-1960s period, uh, in Europe but also in Australia, the design of university campuses, the design of cities, um, of avenues, they went away from the wide avenues to narrower streets in the in the inner city, and it was a very conscious movement um, by a right-wing urban planning, um, you know, ideology, if you like, that would limit the opportunities there were for public gatherings. I think the other thing that we're facing now is the privatisation of public space in the city, and I mean, Liam uh, would also, you know, be probably good to talk to about this too. I mean, this whole campaign for the right to the city. Um, is is a, a genuine, you know, movement, um, uh, you know, for the amount of people that actually live in the CBD in our major cities these days, you know, beyond going and consuming products in the same place, you don't, off, there aren't often opportunities to gather together. And finally, uh, just to say, I guess the, the question of why haven't we had a revolution in, in an advanced capitalist rich country like Australia, I mean... It's partly because there's the capacity for the ruling class to buy off sections of the working class. And in, in Australia, that's, that's very much happened via the Labor Party, via the accord that Liam referred to in his talk. But I think we, we, um, we always... I mean, our party in particular, we always look to this whole question of international solidarity... 
because while things might often seem very depressing <laughs> and like they're not, they're not moving, there's always another example we can look to for inspiration. Um, and so that's been a very important part of our approach, has been emphasising international solidarity with revolutions um, in our overseas, not just in our region, um, and the inspiration that they can provide to workers here. Thanks. So thank you again to our three speakers um, and really all the speakers um, at the two days of this conference have been fantastic and there's never been enough time for discussion so we hope um, these two days have planted some seeds and we can go away and um, continue that discussion. Um, I hope that this conference has inspired you to find out more about different campaigns to get active or more active. Um, and maybe commit yourself uh, to becoming an eco-socialist. Um, Socialist Alliance is the political home for trans activists, disability activists, housing activists, climate activists, unionists, feminists, anti-war peace activists and internationalists, just to name a few. And, <laughs> and Green Left is our platform for all of that via paper, podcast, YouTube and radio. Um, Susan was quoting songs before, so I'm going to join in. Um, in the face of climate destruction and drive to war, I've got to ask, is there anything left to us but to organise and fight? And if your answer is no, then we hope that you will organise and fight with us. We also need you to help us maintain electoral registration um, so that we can continue to promote an eco-socialist message on the streets um, and at election time. Who so thanks everyone for coming, for engaging in the discussion. Um, it's been a, a fantastic two days. Um, I know a lot of contact sheets have gone around, but we're not running out the door. Please go and have a look at the bookshop, buy books, sign up. Um, we send out activist calendars. If you hear from interstate... Um, leave your details here with Melbourne. We can get it to your relevant city or branch so you can stay in the loop with what's happening. Um, and I hope you stick around and have some drinks and a snag, meat or vegetarian. Yes. <laughs> Thanks, everyone. Thank